Welcome to Total MD. In today's video, we're going to be reviewing some additional customization options and navigational tools. We'll also be reviewing the scheduler and creating patients. I want to take a moment and just explain the layout of the system once more. At the top of the screen, we have a toolbar that holds all of the main screens that you'll be working out of. Your patient list, your scheduler, the ledger or accounts, claims, payments, reports, and setup. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have your options menu, which will give you the options applicable within the screen that you are looking at. Here in the light blue section is where we have the name of the screen that you are currently in. At any time you'd like and in any screen, we'll always have the mini toolbar, which contains file where you can set additional program preferences and log out of the system. We have the list menu, which is a master list of all of the different list items available to you. The activities menu, where you can do mass charge entry and processing late fees. And the help menu, which will pull up a help window based on the screen that you're looking at and have additional options for assistance. In the right hand side of the screen, we have the green question mark, which is also a help menu that you can use at any point. We do have a backward and a forward button, just like an internet browser would. And then there's little drop down menus right next to each button. The drop down menus are going to contain all of the screens that you have open that you can go forward to just by directly clicking on that particular screen at any point. This is your home button, which will always take you to your home screen without closing the other screens that you do have open. At the bottom of your options menu, we have a bookmark feature. Bookmarking will simply save the screen that you're in and add it as an item down here along the bottom blue section. Bookmarking the screen does not save the data within the screen if you're currently making changes. It does not cancel the data in the screen. It simply holds your place so that you can go back to that particular moment where you were at if you get interrupted. Another helpful way you can use the bookmarking feature is if you run an extensive report, bookmarking that report will save you from having to continue to rerun it if you have to leave that screen to go to another. You may have some additional icons in the top right corner of the screen depending on the version of the system that you're on. I want to point out the icon which is this double sheet of paper here. That will link us to our Total MD Document Center which is where you can scan patients' documents import documents, and we'll help you go paperless with that patient. I want to talk about the home screen for a moment. We have several categories already set up here. All of this can be customized. Each person using the system can have their own home page if they'd like to. The home page is designed to be a quick access space to go to, to pull up a calculator, to create a prescription, to run specific common reports, and can also be used as a to-do list for daily activities for your staff. The web link section, which again can be customized, will actually open up a website within your Total MD program. We also have a space off to the side where you could set up practice financial graphs and information if you'd like. To customize this page, I'm gonna go to my options menu and the only option I have is customize the page. So I'm gonna click on that just once with a single left click. Once I have my home page screen open, I'm gonna choose the category that I'd like to edit. You can also add additional categories if you look to the left. We have a new category or delete category option. If everyone would like to share a home page but have their own category, you can set up new categories for each staff member in your office. I'm gonna go ahead and add a web link into the system. So to do so, I'm gonna select the web link category. You know you've selected that category for two reasons. There is a little arrow pointing you to that category and the category is now highlighted in blue. Blue is our color in the system that shows you you've selected a specific item to work with. Now off to the right, we have category items. Currently, we just have one website or web link listed on our home page. So here's the one and only category item currently in place. 
If I want to add a category item, I'm going to go to my options menu and click new category item. I'm going to go ahead and give this a caption or a name as to what the website is that I'll be going to or what function I'm hoping to get by clicking on that button. And I'm going to go ahead and add in the ICD-10 data.com website to look up ICD-10 codes. So I'm going to name this ICD-10 data. The action I want to take is to open a file. The file is going to be the web page. You do have a number of different actions in here such as previewing a report, printing a report, displaying a screen, and displaying information. Obviously choose what suits the needs in the moment. If you're running a report, you're going to want to preview it or print it, for example. Again, we're going to open a file, and then the easiest thing to do here is just copy and paste the web address right into this space, including the HTTP. So I've already copied it. I'm just going to paste it in this section. And then you want to use your tab button to tab through the end of the line to make sure the system realizes you're done with that line item. And now if we go to our options menu and I've finished editing my home page, I'm going to close the screen, which you'll notice there is a hotkey for F4 on your keyboard if you like to use the hotkeys. Now we have ICD-10 data that pops in here under web links almost instantaneously. If I click on that, it takes me right to ICD-10data.com's website. And I can proceed to look up an ICD-10 code. I'm going to go ahead and close out of that screen now that you understand how this works. And I'm going to move on to our mini toolbar at the top of the screen. Under File, we have Program Preferences, which you can also get to by clicking on Setup and Set Up the Practice. We've reviewed this in a previous video, so I'm not going to go backwards to that. But if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact the training department at TotalMD. Under My Preferences, we do have the option here to set up specific types of reports as defaulted reports to go to specific defaulted printers. And you can also set it to Quick Print, which would remove the Print Preview option. For example, I may want to use a specific patient statement every time I click Print Statement. Instead of having to choose one of the options available to me each time, I might want to set one as the default. I'll go ahead and choose walkout statement with diagnosis codes. And then I can default it to print to a specific printer if there are multiples in the office. Since I know what I'm expecting to get with this, I'm going to go ahead and mark it as a quick print item. You can set up some or all of these items as defaulted reports with the default printer with quick print if you would like to. And just for the sake of training, I'm going to go ahead and leave these off of Quick Print so we can actually get a print preview when we run them. Then in the Options menu, you would simply click Save Changes when you're ready. Also under File, we have My Home Page, which again is, which is an additional place that you can customize your home page. If you happen to be a billing company or are running multiple practices, you can click Open Practice and create a brand new database that will have a completely different set of patients and a completely different set of practice information and setup items based on what you enter into a new database. We also have the Close All Screens option, which if you did have multiple screens open, layered one on top of the other, clicking Close All Screens will close out all of them and take you back to your home page to start fresh. You can click Backup Practice Files, and this is a quick, easy way to run a backup on your practice. Punch in a description of the backup. Choose a destination, which could be an external hard drive or a flash drive and then give your file a name and simply click the backup button. It takes about one minute or so to run this backup, depending on the size of your practice and data. Also under file, we have restore practice files. If you did have to actually utilize that backup, you choose the location that the backup is in after you plug in the access point to your data and simply run that to restore. We also have a batch export option, which you can export different data out of your system. And under File is Exit, which is the cleanest way to close your program at the end of the day. 
We're going to jump to the list menu and I'll give you a brief overview of what each of these items does. The patient list is a master list of all of your patients. Provider list is a master list of all of your providers entered into the system. The insurance plan list, you can directly add new plans to this or you can do it from within the patient's file. The address list is essentially a digital Rolodex for pharmacies, for referring providers, or providers that you might refer out to, and essentially anyone who's not a patient. Also under the address list, that's where you're going to place your facility information for other facilities you might perform treatment at. The ASAP list is a list of patients with appointments that would like an appointment as soon as possible. Your billing code list is a list that you'll create to tag your patients with a certain type of billing code so you can reference that and know how they get billed. Electronic Claims Module List is already preset with the two companies that TotalMD directly integrates with for sending eClaims. We will work with other companies to send eClaims. It'll just take a couple extra clicks to do so. Also under the List menu is an Appointment List, which could be the fastest way to find out when someone is scheduled. A Recall List, which is a great way to set patients up with a reminder system to bring them back to the office. We have a reason list which will attach to the appointments so you can put a reason code onto the appointment such as new patient exam or annual physical and other items such as that. We do have a fee schedule list which will give you a listing of all of the different fee schedules you might enter into the system. Again, see the previous video to this for instructions on how to set up a fee schedule. The service code list is a master list of all of the codes in your system that you might bill out with, adjustment codes, payment codes, and different types of account codes. Account code list is only going to give you account codes such as adjustments and payments and notes. The diagnosis code list is a listing of all your diagnosis codes. Patient search and reminders decision support, order list, and encounter list are all EHR items which we'll be covering in a later session. Moving on to the activities menu, if I click the claims button that takes me to the claims screen where I can send my e-claims or print out claims as I'd like. Payments is the same as if I were to click on the payment screen here and that'll show you all the payments you've collected and you can narrow that down by date and other options. Ledger will open up a ledger for you. Statement Manager will allow you to effectively manage your statements that you're sending out to patients. Mass Charge Entry does just that. Encounter Charge Entry allows you to post charges from the encounters you create. EHR Holding Tank may or may not be something that you utilize, but we'll discuss that when we get to the EHR portion of our training. Applying remittance file is if you receive an electronic remittance to post your payments. Process late fees if you want to mass charge patients for late payments. Collections is a collections module that you can send your patients out to collections from within the system. Launch EMR link is something that our tech support folks will be utilizing. We do have a custom tab designer section for those of you who are who are more advanced computer users, we can certainly do a training session on that. Scheduler takes you to your schedule. View monthly revenue will give you a month at a glance view of the charges you've posted and the payments you've collected. We do have several graphs set up under view graphs that are going to track various items such as payments posted. We have create new prescription as an option and reports, which is the same as if you were to click on the reports screen. The provider dashboard all the way down to TotalMD Direct. Again, those are EHR items and we'll be covering those at a later session. Under help, we have all of your help menu options and the other relevant items here our remote technical support. If we were to click on that, it takes you to our TotalMD portal in which one of our TotalMD staff members could give you an invitation code to allow us to join your computer session so that we can see what you see. Also under help we have About TotalMD. 
This will tell you the details of what version of the program you're running on, as well as give you our 1-800 number and what edition that you're running on of that version. So this is Service Pack 3 of our Total MD EHR version 6 for 2013. That about covers the additional customization and navigation at the moment, so I'm going to go ahead and dive into the scheduler so we can create our first patient. You can create a new patient in two ways, either by creating an appointment for them and activating their appointment when they show up at the office, or by going directly to your patient list and creating them as a new patient in which they do not have to have an appointment assigned as of yet. I'm going to start by going to the scheduler. It's a single left click on the scheduler, opens the schedule up to today's date. I'm going to point out a few features of the scheduler that are pretty handy. We do have an interactive calendar here in the top left corner, which I can click and jump to a different year on very quickly. I can also click the month and choose a different month that I want to go to if I want to jump further ahead in the future. You also have a single arrow which will take you to the next month from where you're at and the double arrow will take you a year forward in time. We also have previous months and previous years. You can simply click on a date that you'd like to go to and it displays up here where the name of the screen you're in is typically showing. You also have a go to today button to quickly jump back to today's schedule, a plus 14 day, plus 90 day, and plus six months button if you need to schedule out in the future. I do have the option of looking at a daily view of the schedule, which is what we're seeing now. We're just displaying one date. And down here in the bottom right corner of the screen is where you can see the different view options. We have the daily view, the weekly view, and the monthly view of the schedule. The weekly view looks like this. It's showing you the whole week that you have open. And you would be able to see appointments listed here if we did have any scheduled as of yet. The monthly view, it's great for trying to plan out vacation days to see where the schedule seems to be more open so that you can go ahead and block off time. I'm going to switch back to the daily view and work off of that. I do have two columns that I've created and I'm currently looking at the resource view of the schedule. That means my plan is to schedule appointments based on what exam rooms are available, not based on the provider. So when I look at the schedule, I have two rooms in my office. If I have someone booked in room one, I'll know that my other provider needs to use room two. You can switch to the provider view of the schedule. And I'm going to go ahead and say yes to edit that. And this is asking me what columns I want to add under the provider view. Down here towards the bottom, I click add. I choose provider and select the one provider that I have in the system so far and save him to my provider view. Save my changes. And now under providers, I have my two exam rooms and I also have my one provider attached. So we've got three columns that we can book within now as well. Once I decide upon the view of the scheduler I'd like to see, I can go ahead and click this little floppy disk, which is our save button for the view that you're looking at. I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the resource view and hit my save button. Jumping over to the left-hand side of the screen, I want to go over a few options that we have available. Close screen, of course, is going to close your scheduler and take you back to the previous screen that you were looking at. If you'd like to keep your scheduler open throughout the day, you can simply leave it open and layer other screens on top of the one that we're looking at and either close those or use your back button to get back to the scheduler. You can also bookmark the window if you'd like to have a quick access point for your scheduler. We do have a refresh screen option if for some reason you're concerned that someone else might be booking in a time slot and you want to click refresh really quickly to just make sure that time slot didn't get taken. Although the screen does refresh automatically approximately every three seconds. Typically during working hours, you're also going to see a red box around the time that you're currently in, which is a nice visual indicator as to whether or not you're running on time with the patient scheduled. Under the Manage Appointments, 
section here in your options menu, we have view monthly revenue. This screen will allow you to view your month at a glance for either posted charges or posted payments. You can also set up a daily goal, which will accumulate into a monthly goal if you would like to. To set the daily goal, I simply click on the day I want to set, click my set daily goal option from the options menu, and let's say our goal is to produce $3,000 in charges and collect $3,000 in payments. Plug those numbers in, save my changes, and you might notice that there's a little red sliver next to the goal and as we get closer and closer to the goal that red will fill up the line then turn to yellow and then to green once we hit our daily goal. You can also jump ahead to different months or work your way backward to previous months for comparison. Going back to the scheduler, we also have your appointment list, which is, as I mentioned earlier, the fastest way to find out when someone is scheduled, especially if you already have your scheduler open. We have a few default search options, so here in the search space we could type in the date, we could type in a chart number, an ID number for the patient, the date the appointment was modified, etc. I like to customize the screen a little bit because there's a few items that I personally like to search by that you probably would too. So above this gray line we can add additional filter options. If I go to my options menu and click customize filter, these are all of our searchable options that we can plug into the system. So I'd like to search by the patient's last name and or their first name. You can do both or just one option. Perhaps you'd like to search by the day of the week the patient's scheduled and maybe the status of their appointment, be it confirmed, unconfirmed, or missed, etc. It might also be handy to add whoever is on the ASAP list if you're looking for people that you could call quickly on your schedule to bump up to a sooner appointment. If we scroll through the bottom section, we also have some additional options. I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that and click the OK button. And now we've got our new searchable filter options here at the top of the screen. Any of your list screens can be customized in this same way by clicking Customize Filter and you can add new searchable options. You can also customize your view. The view are these blue headings that you're seeing with information regarding the screen that you're in. So in this case it would be information regarding that patient's appointment. You can move these items around simply by left clicking and dragging the item and letting go where you'd like to place it. And you can also resort your data based on these little blue headers. If I click on last name, it's going to resort my entire list alphabetically by last name in descending order, so A to Z. If I click it again, it's going to resort my entire list by last name alphabetically in ascending order, which is Z to A. So there's a lot of options of how you can choose to view the screen and find the information that you're looking for quickly. And we can customize the view as well simply by clicking Customize View from your Options menu. The left-hand side is showing you the items that are available. The right-hand side are the items that we're currently viewing. So I could scroll through the left-hand side. I'd like to display anybody's email address that might have one. And perhaps, again, if they're on the ASAP list, remember this isn't searching for people, this is just simply displaying your information. You're viewing your data. I could also scroll down, and perhaps I want to see the length of the appointment the patient has. Then I click my OK button, and now we've added a few extra fields here. I'm going to go ahead and shorten up some of these items just so we can see what's hanging off the screen, although we did just a moment ago have a scroll bar down here at the bottom of the screen that comes in handy. Once we add some appointments to the scheduler, we'll be able to come back to the appointment list and do a patient search. Also in the options menu, we have creating appointments, adding an appointment, or finding an open time slot. Find Open Time Slot is a really handy tool to find an opening if you have a particular patient that is only available on a certain date at a certain time. So if I click Find Open Time Slot, I can plug in my parameters here. Perhaps um, they want to be seen within the next month. 
And let's also suppose that your patient is only available between 4 and 5 p.m. If they're needing an hour-long appointment, we want to make sure to change the length of time to 60 minutes. So anywhere you see length in the program, it's going to be calculating in minutes. If they need to see a specific provider, you can select that from the drop-down menu or they have to be scheduled in a certain room due to x-ray equipment or other types of equipment that might be available to you. You can go ahead and select the specific rooms as well. I'm going to just leave those parameters and let's go ahead and suppose that that patient is only available. The let's also suppose that your patient's only available on Wednesdays. So we're going to deselect every day except for Wednesday. So now we're looking for an appointment within the next month between 4 and 5 p.m. for one hour in exam room two on a Wednesday. You don't have to set all of these parameters, but the more specific you get, the quicker you're going to find the time slot the patient's looking for. So now at this point, I'm going to go ahead to my options menu and click find open time slot. The system will highlight in blue the first available time slot based on the parameters you entered. So it did find exam room 2 between 4 and 5 p.m. for one hour on a Wednesday. If that time slot does not happen to work out for that patient, we're going to go to the options menu and click find another time slot. And it takes us to Wednesday, November 11th at 4 p.m. If the patient does agree to that day and time, we're going to go ahead and click on the single line where we'd like to, where we would like the appointment to begin. And I'm going to click add appointment from the options menu. It is also a click and point scheduler, so I can simply double click on this time slot and it'll do the same thing as selecting the time and clicking add appointment. Now we're in the appointment entry screen and if I had an existing patient to choose to schedule, I would simply type in their chart number here, which is based on the first three letters of their last name and then the first two letters of their first name and a unique three digit number. Since I do not have any patients set up in my system yet, I'm going to create a new patient by skipping past this patient search field and I'm going to go ahead and plug in the last name of our patient. We'll go with Clooney and I'm using the tab button to jump down to the first name space and I'm going to type in George. I'm going to go ahead and put in any information I do happen to know about our new patient, George Clooney, including punching in a phone number. I do not have to put dashes or spaces. The computer will format that for me once I move past the field. Next, we have an option to select a color for our patient's appointment so that you might have a visual cue what the patient might be coming in for. I'm going to choose our purple color, which is new patient. The length of time, I can use the arrow up button to go up in time units or down to go down. I'm simply going to click and type 60 for a one hour appointment. So far, the appointment is unconfirmed, so I'm going to leave it as such and move to the notes section. Here is where you have the opportunity to enter in a few blurbs about the patient that might be relevant before they come in. Concerned about right eye, last physical was two years ago, no other notable issues. We may also want to put in a little bit of information as to how we might be billing them or collecting money, cash patient. And then moving on to this top right section, they're scheduled to see John Smith. If we had another provider in the system, we could select the other provider for the appointment as well. And we have a space here for the reason of the appointment. Um, the reason would be an exam 
And in the exam, we're going to, of course, focus on checking that right eye, for example. I don't have any reason codes set up in the system yet, which if you recall, under the list menu, we have a reason list where you could enter all reasons in at once and have a master list and therefore just choose one from the drop down menu. Since I haven't created a master list of reasons, I can go ahead and add one on the fly simply by clicking this magnifying glass to the right of the field I'm in. Once I click that, it actually opens up my reason list and I have none to search through. However, if I go to my options menu, I do have my customized view and filter there just to point that out as we're scanning past it. I can select new reason put in a code or some sort of definer to choose that item. We're going to go ahead with NP for new patient and the description is going to be new patient exam. I can also choose a default color for that reason and as you can see we've got our new patient color there so it makes sense to link those together. And then we can go ahead and set up a default length for the appointment for your new patients. Um, perhaps we want to choose 45 minutes for a new patient exam as a standard appointment. This patient we may want an additional 15 minutes because it's the end of the day and we know we might be running over. So for the default, I'll choose 45. We're going to go ahead and save our changes. And now we have a new patient reason code in the system. I can click select reason and now it's going to populate here next to the reason for the appointment. Here is the date and time of the appointment. I can make it a recurring appointment if it's going to be a standing appointment for whatever reason. And to make it a recurring appointment, you'll notice when I hover over the word none, it turns blue and underlined. Remember what that means is I can click on that and it'll open up a screen for me or in this case a pop-up window. I can set this up to be an everyday event for the next two years, an every other day event for the next two years, or I do have weekly, monthly, or yearly events that I can create. Let's say that this is a weekly event, but it's going to occur every two weeks on a Wednesday, and it's not for the next two years. We're going to make it end in two months. So down here at the bottom, we have a little blurb. It's every other week on a Wednesday. We'll go ahead and click OK. Now this patient will have recurring appointments already set up in the system. I do want to point out we do have the little checkbox here inside the appointment that says place on ASAP list. So that's going to indicate that the patient would like an appointment as soon as possible. Also, I want to go ahead and plug into the notes section their personal preference for their appointment. So if we remember correctly, they want a Wednesday at 4 p.m. as soon as possible. I want that to be the first note I have inside the note section because when we look at the ASAP list, there's only so much of these notes that you're going to be able to see. And because the, the point of the ASAP list is to call them in sooner, these details are really important to have displayed right off the front end. If we look to our options menu, we have a couple different options here, such as entering the patient's address. If you do happen to get that ahead of time, we can plug it in. And it, when I hit the tab button to move to the next field, it jumps down to postal code. The system will remember cities and states for you um, based on linking those to the postal code. Um, so if I plug one, a, post, a zip code in, 85213, it does happen to recall that and it filled in Mesa, Arizona for me. If it did not know that zip code, it would take me back to city and make me put in the data for city and state. At this point, I can simply save my changes, and now I have a new patient appointment down here in the bottom right side on November 11th, and just wait for that new patient to come in. If we go take a look at our patient list, we're going to see George Clooney is not in our patient list yet.
That's because he's only an appointment right now with certain data inside of that appointment. Until he comes in and we actually create his file, he's not going to be inside of our patient list. If you'd like to create his patient file before he makes it to the office, you certainly can do so. Um, the benefit to waiting is that you don't have patients in your system that never showed up. But of course, if you do go ahead and create their patient file now, you could collect all of their insurance information and have it all plugged in before the patient shows up. So depending on the practice that you're running, you may decide to do it one way or the other. Looking at this appointment, I do want to point out a few options. Here where George Clooney's name is, the line is purple, so that is the color indicating what type of appointment we're expecting out of George Clooney, which would be a new patient appointment. I also want to point out that it did only give me three timelines. Each line is representing 15 minutes, so it did shorten the appointment automatically to 45 minutes because the new patient designation is a 45-minute appointment. Now that it is on the schedule, I can click the appointment, go to the bottom of the appointment where I get the two-way arrow, left-click, and drag downward. I do get a warning that states this is a recurring appointment. I can change all of the all of the repeating appointments to be an hour or only this one appointment or only the future appointments or not to modify at all. I'm going to select to only modify this current appointment. So now we have a one hour appointment for George Clooney. You'll notice every time I hover over the appointment we get a little pop-up on the screen. That pop-up is displaying the six line items of information that we set up under our setup section in the previous video. So under the program preferences section and the scheduling tab that we did go through in the previous video. What's nice about that is if the patient has a shorter appointment and you can't see all that displayed information simply by looking at the appointment, all you have to do is hover your mouse over it. A few other items I want to point out here on the appointment is we do have a side line and that line is representing which provider the patient is scheduled to see. Each provider can have a specific color appointed to them, which we also did in the previous video. We do have a little person icon here with a piece of paper behind it. That is your visual cue that this is a new patient without a file created yet. So looking at the scheduler, I have no question as to whether or not this person has been here before. The red dot is indicating that their appointment is an unconfirmed appointment, meaning nobody has called them yet to confirm, or they were called and they were not reached yet. That red dot will change to different colors and different shapes based on the other statuses that you might choose. If I need to bump this appointment up in the day because George calls and says he's available a little bit sooner, I can simply click the appointment with a single left click. Once I have it selected, we see this blue halo around the entire appointment. If I want to move this appointment up, I'm going to go to the line where George Clooney's name is and we get a little four-way arrow. Once I get that four-way arrow, I'm going to left click and hold my mouse down and drag the appointment up to the appropriate time that George is available to come. I can also move it to another column and anywhere all over this day. I'm going to go ahead and reset him for 3.30 on November 11th. If he needed to come in on a different date and reschedule his appointment, since the appointment is still selected because of the blue halo, I can right click on the appointment for additional options and I can add it to my clipboard or I can cut and paste the appointment. The difference between the two is cut appointment is going to pick up the appointment and I have it waiting to be pasted somewhere else on my schedule. I'm going to go ahead to today's date by using my go to today button, select a time, right click and paste the appointment here. If George calls and says, 
I may want to move my appointment. Do you happen to have anything available next week on Wednesday? I don't know for sure that I'm giving up this time slot. So I'm going to select the appointment with the single left click, right click the appointment, and add it to my clipboard instead of cutting and pasting the appointment. So if I click Add to Clipboard, it leaves the original appointment where it's at, but it gives me a copy of that appointment hovering up here in the corner. I could go ahead over to Wednesday, November 11th, and see if I have any availability, and that copy follows me wherever I go on the schedule. It will not move the original appointment until I select the copy and hold my left click down on the mouse and drag that appointment to a time slot I wish it to appear in. Now that I've clicked and dragged that appointment, it will remove the original appointment that was scheduled for today. Right clicking will give you many additional options as well to help manage your patient and manage the appointment. We do have an edit appointment option and also a delete option. If you do delete this appointment, the data inside of this appointment will not be saved. Because this is a new patient and we don't have a file created yet, the only place that data is, is on the appointment. So deleting will not keep track of that information in any way whatsoever. Adding it to the clipboard allows you to move it how I just showed you. And then we have the option to create the patient file, which we'll go over in just a moment. I can also make a copy of the appointment, which is essentially creating a second appointment, and paste the copy on next Wednesday if I know he needs to come back again for the exact same thing. However, he's only going to be a new patient once, so we're not going to make a copy today. I can cut the appointment as I showed you just a little bit ago and paste it elsewhere. I do have the option to print the schedule. I can separate today's repeat appointments. I can send an email reminder to this appointment or all appointments in this view, this view being the daily view that we're looking at. And so essentially that's an, an appointment reminder for everybody. And then I have change status to indicate if we left them a message, confirm their appointment, or if they're checked in, being seen, checking out, etc. I have check eligibility if you do sign up for real-time eligibility with your clearinghouse. And then I have the option to create a new encounter for this patient. Again, that's an EHR component and we'll go over that at a later video. At this point, I want to go ahead and say that we called George Clooney and he confirmed his appointment. So I'm simply going to click the appointment with a single left click. So we have our blue halo. I'm going to right click on the appointment for my options as to what we can do to the appointment. And I'm going to change the status of the appointment from unconfirmed to confirmed. Now we all know George Clooney is planning on being here. <laughs> And let's say we did have something open up on our schedule for a bit sooner. My first move is to go to the list menu and the ASAP list and see if anyone on the ASAP list might want the appointment that I have available. In opening the ASAP list, I can see that we have two appointments currently on the schedule that I'm looking at. I do want to sort this list personally by date, so I'm going to click on date, and I have it from the soonest date to the latest date. If I click again, it'll flip the order on me. So we do have on 11-4 a confirmed appointment for 2 o'clock for George Clooney. He doesn't have a chart number yet because he's not an active patient as of yet. We do have his phone number available and that's just a home phone. Remember we can customize our view and display his mobile phone as well if we would like. He's scheduled in exam room 2 with Dr. Smith. We don't have a dollar value assigned to him. He does have a recurring appointment, however, for every other week. And you can see in one of his appointments, I do have my note that he wants a Wednesday at 4 p.m. as soon as possible. He is on the ASAP list, and the length of his appointment is displayed here. This gives me a clue as to whether or not I want to call George Clooney and invite him to come in at the appointment time that I now have available. I do have the option here in my options menu to go to his appointment on the scheduler, which um, 
takes you right to the appropriate date and time you need to be at to look and evaluate that appointment. We're going to go ahead and jump to the future and say that George Clooney has actually come in for his appointment. So we're going to select the appointment so it's got the blue halo. Right click for options, change the status to checked in. This is going to indicate our patients here, but they're not quite ready to be seen yet. Perhaps George is filling out his paperwork. While he's completing that, I'm going to go ahead and create his patient file since he is here in the office. I have two options to do that. I can right click and select create the patient file from the appointment options, or I can go to my options menu and see, find my same little person icon and click create the patient file. Once I hit create patient file, it takes me to the patient information screen for George Clooney. The data that we entered onto that appointment does come across onto the patient information screen. So we do see the phone numbers and we do see that he is assigned to Dr. John Smith. I can go ahead and fill out any additional information onto the patient's information screen once he brings me his new patient health history form. We're going to go ahead and say George likes to be called Georgie. And we are going to list him as the head of household, which is the default in the system for your new patients. Head of household is simply indicating who's responsible for this patient's bill. If George was a child and his mom paid the bill, you could enter mom into the system by adding a new family member and making the mother the head of household so that the statement we send is addressed to her instead of to George. To do so, you would uncheck self and then select the patient who is responsible for the bill for this account. The head of household and the subscriber of the insurance are two separate things in our system. So it's important to note that head of household is only for billing the statement. I'm going to go ahead and plug in an email address for good old George so that we have it to email him appointment reminders and perhaps email him his encounter if you're planning on doing that. And then I can mark a preferred method of contact via phone, email, text, or other just for our information. I do have a space here to enter George's employer if you'd like to know that for insurance purposes or just as an FYI. And you'll notice we don't have anything available to us in our drop-down menu. The employer is one of the items that's part of the address list. So if I'd like to enter that in on the fly, I can simply click the magnifying glass. It'll take me to my master list for employers. I have none, so I go to my options menu and click new address. The type of address entry is really important because that is what dictates where the employer shows up in which space to choose from. So we're going to go ahead and say that George works at Kraft Foods. You could plug in a street address and phone number, any additional information about the employer that you'd like. I'm going to keep it simple and save our changes here. I just want to point out first that you do have the option to view any other employees that may be part of Kraft as well. So if the insurance should change for all of Kraft Foods, it makes it easy to find out who else has that same insurance that you might need to redirect. Now that we've got Kraft in our list as an employer, I'm going to go ahead and select that address item and it populates it right onto our patient information screen. I want to go ahead and point out down here in the bottom left section, we also have a space to indicate how the patient found you and was brought to your office. If another patient referred George Clooney, we could click the drop down and select the existing patient from your patient list. If George was referred by another provider, once again, we'd click the drop down and select from our provider list. We don't have a current provider list, so we're going to select the magnifying glass. That opens up our address list items for provider search. We don't have any, as you can see, so we're going to click new address. Once again, this is the address entry screen. We're going to go ahead and choose type, which is referring provider, if we would like this to show up in the referring provider section. And we'll go ahead and put in the name 
Dr. Nathan Jorgensen. The name section up here at the top is for the name of the practice, and then you have first and last name for the name of the actual provider. We could plug in the street address of Dr. Jorgensen's practice, along with phone number, the best person to contact, and notes such as perhaps office hours. We have a space for NPI information and other IDs that you may want to enter. We can choose Dr. Jorgensen's specialty. We'll go ahead and say that he's an allergist. And then we do have a place for Dr. Jorgensen's direct address, if he should have one. The direct address is what is required for this provider in order to securely email a patient's records. One clue as to whether or not they have a direct email address is that their email address they give you will have the word direct in it. You do have a section here to plug in the Medicaid number or any additional PINs or ID numbers for this provider if they become relevant. Otherwise, we'll simply save our changes and then select this address as the referring provider. Now Dr. Jorgensen is in your system to use for any other patients that you may refer to or get a referral from him. Referral source is somewhat of a generic field to track how a patient was referred to you if it's outside of a provider sending them or another patient referring them. This is something that does come in handy if you do pay for any sort of marketing. For example, you might have a billboard and you might want to know if that billboard is actually bringing you in patients. So you want to attach the billboard as a referral source to any patient that comes in that states that's how they first learned about you. So then you can see if your marketing dollars are paying off. Again, referral source is an address list item as well. So we're going to click the magnifying glass, click new address, and then the type here is going to be referral. And we'll go ahead and put billboard on Broadway as the referral source we're entering. Simply save our changes, select the address if that's how the patient also found you, and then move on to the next section. You'll notice there is an additional space here for contact preference. You will want to fill this out as well because it does pertain to EHR if you are participating in electronic health records. The top right box is going to contain any notes that you'd like to make about the patient. Perhaps um, we'll put in a note, typically prefers a Wednesday appointment at 4. Do not call home number before 8 a.m. and those sorts of notes. In the alerts box, anything that's vital that you want to be alerted when you open that patient record, you're going to go ahead and type that here, such as patient comes in a wheelchair. So you may have to get out a ramp to place at your front door if you don't have one already built in to accommodate folks that arrive in a wheelchair. Any other type of alerts here is fine. Just go ahead and click and type in this box. Another feature that's really nice about these boxes is you can highlight over the words, right click and change the font, including the font style, uh, the size, and the color. And go ahead and click OK. So if there's something really important, you can make it big and bold and red or some other color that catches your eye. We do have the option here to mark that this is not a patient if you're plugging them in simply for billing purposes, such as being the head of household or under the insurance to be the subscriber of the insurance plan. Also, if the patient happens to move away or for whatever other reason, you can go ahead and mark them inactive if that does come into play. This middle section will populate after we save our changes here, so we're going to keep plugging on until we get to a good stopping point. So we've got some obvious choices to enter. Birth date, you can just type in the digits. You do not have to use the drop down menu. And I do not have to put in all four digits of the year. Under language, once you click the drop down menu, you can begin to type in the language and it will take you to what you've typed in so far. So you don't have to scroll quite so much. And then just below, we have a space for billing code. 
Remember that that is also a list item if you'd like to find the master list of billing codes and create them all at once. I'm going to go ahead and create a new billing code for cash patients and save my changes. Close the screen and then I can say Mr. George Clooney is a cash patient. You do have a free form space here you can type in which is for indicator if you'd like to say um, he is a cash patient and he always pays when he's in office you may decide that an indicator for in office payment is a one if he mails you a check after he gets home he might be a cash patient that's an indicator number two these are all things that you can decide upon within your office based on what makes sense I do have a space in this upper right corner to plug in a picture for the patient. If you do have a little webcam sitting at your desk or one attached to your computer, you can go to your options menu and acquire the picture. And I would choose where I am acquiring that from, which in that case would be a webcam. Or I can load a patient picture if the patient emails you their glamour shot, for example or maybe you took the photo and just saved it to your computer somewhere. So I'm going to go ahead and load in George Clooney's photo here. And just for the sake of you being able to see the appointments that we have scheduled for George, I'm going to go ahead and click Save Changes at this moment. You'll notice too that it takes us back to our scheduler, which was layered underneath the screen we were looking at. And you can see that that little new person icon is gone. I wanna get back into George's patient information screen so we could wrap up the details inside of there. I do still have his appointment selected because of the blue halo, you can see that. So in my options menu under patient information, I can go to view patient information. I can also right click on the appointment and click view patient information from there. We do get an alert pop up which tells us he comes in a wheelchair. We can click the OK box to get past that. And now we're going to finish populating the rest of George's information. I'm going to go ahead with these other tabs and then we'll get into insurance information. So first we'll go to medical alerts. George gave us his medical history information after he walked in and sat down and filled it out. So we can see that George is allergic to latex and he's got back problems and perhaps he gets headaches on occasion. On the right hand side of the screen, I don't have any medications that I need to enter for George. However, if I did, this is set to pull that information based on what's entered inside of Dr. First, which is our e-prescribing tool. And it's also where you can reconcile the patient's medications. I don't have any immunization records for George as of yet either, so I'm going to go ahead and just leave that space alone, although this would populate based on the immunizations that may or may not get reported to you, depending on the type of practice you are. The next tab over is for extra information and to plug in an emergency contact for George, including a home and mobile phone number. And then we have 11 extra spaces that are available for you to use in whatever way you deem necessary. One such example of this could be a credit card on file, if that's how George likes to pay, if that is how George likes to pay. And do keep in mind that these extra fields you can add to customize your view and customize your filter on any one of these list screens as well. So you may decide the extra one is always going to be for any specific payment information. Extra two could be the patient's physician. Extra three could be the patient's physician's phone number. You can utilize these spaces for anything that you deem necessary. We also have a place for a patient's security question along with their answer to verify who you're speaking to over the phone. 
We do have a patient vitals encounter and family history section, which we'll get into when we look at the EHR portion of our training. So now I'm gonna jump over to insurance information. I wanna point out that the release of information is selected by default. That basically means you do have HIPAA acknowledgement to submit claims on behalf of the patient. We have a space for primary insurance, secondary insurance, and tertiary insurance, along with an authorization number and visit count. If the patient does not have secondary or tertiary insurance, please leave these fields completely blank as they are. We'd previously mentioned that George Clooney does not have any insurance. However, we're gonna go ahead and attach some insurance just for training purposes. If you already have an insurance plan entered into the system, next to carrier, you can click the drop down and find that appropriate insurance plan that you've previously entered. As you can see, I have the name of the insurance company, the city for the claims mailing address, the group name and group number for craft and we also have a space for insurance type if that's filled out. If this is George's insurance, which it is through Craft, I would simply select that plan, put in the relationship to the subscriber, which we could say that George carries his own insurance, so it would be self, plug in a copay amount, his policy ID number, and then a group number here, should that apply as well. We also have a box for assignment of benefits, which is defaulted to be checked as well. That is indicating that our office would like the insurance company to pay us any benefits for George instead of paying George, the patient. Under the deductible section, we can go ahead and plug in what his total individual annual deductible is and for the family as well. When that deductible will renew and if he's met any of that deductible thus far. If George does have Medicaid or Medicare as a primary insurance and they are going to automatically submit the secondary insurance for you, supposing he has secondary insurance, here on the secondary plan you can go ahead and mark that plan to be a crossover plan, meaning this insurance company will automatically cross the claim over to the secondary insurance for you. At the bottom of the screen, if you had submitted a pre-authorization and you had an authorization number for a visit series, you could plug that in here and any details that you do know, just enter that data that may apply. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this insurance plan and create one from scratch so that you guys can see how that works. So I'll click the remove button so I can start fresh and I'm going to click the magnifying glass to choose a carrier that's not currently entered already. Once I'm in the master list of insurance plans, I go to my options menu and click new insurance plan. I'm going to go ahead and plug in the name of the insurance company I'm billing to, the claims mailing address, a phone number for the insurance company, fax number, and if you have a contact there at Blue Cross Blue Shield, group name we could enter, and group number. This may be a different plan with different benefits from the previous Blue Cross Blue Shield plan with the craft group that we already have in existence. Local plan, yes or no. And here we are able to attach a fee schedule to this insurance plan. Whatever fee schedule you do attach here is the fee schedule that will show up on the patient's ledger that you bill the patient and that you bill the insurance. So it's important to choose wisely. If you do not choose a fee schedule here, the system will default to whatever is in the number one position in your system, which should be your office fees. We have a space for payer ID number for this insurance type and how many days we have to file claims to this insurance company. We'll go ahead and say 60 days. If you are doing real-time eligibility, this is where you're going to plug in the eligibility ID number, which you will get from the clearinghouse. You do have a free form space to categorize this insurance plan or insurance company if you'd like. For example, we could say all Blue Cross Blue Shield plans are Category 1 plans, and there are certain insurance reports you could run and specify, I only want to see 
category one plans on this report. Or you could use a character here, such as a star, or you could even use a letter. So it's a way for you to create a grouping or a category within the insurance plan list based on what makes sense to you from a reporting standpoint. If you are sending electronic claims, make sure you check the box. If you are doing real-time eligibility, make sure you check that box as well. And go ahead and choose the appropriate module that you're doing e-claims through. Again, if it's not one of these items that's currently on our list, make sure you talk to tech support and get set up correctly for sending e-claims. We can go ahead and choose what type of insurance plan this is and say that it is a commercial plan and it's a PPO plan. The information in this middle section is to populate on the claim form. So for example, in box 24, if you don't want the individual's NPI, meaning the doctor's NPI, you can go ahead and change it to enter the group NPI anytime you bill to Blue Cross Blue Shield. The same is true for these other sections here. If you are billing ICD-10 codes to Blue Cross Blue Shield, please make sure you select this box, accepts ICD-10. We have the option to mark this as a do not bill insurance plan if you do not want a claim created for this insurance plan and do not bill patient if you do not want a statement generated for any patients attached to this insurance plan. We do have a space here for default payment codes whenever you're posting payments that have come through based on this insurance plan. So for example, generically we have insurance check payment as a payment code. Let's say you want Blue Cross to have its own designated heading for the insurance check payments you receive from them. What I would do is click the magnifying glass to go to my master list of codes, click new code to create a new one, enter in some sort of abbreviated code, BCBS, PAY, works for me, Blue Cross Blue Shield payment, put in the description, and then the type of code I'm entering is an insurance check payment. And then I simply save my changes. Close out of the screen, and here in my drop-down list, I can choose Blue Cross Blue Shield payment, as a default payment code so that that's what's displayed on my patient's ledger instead of insurance check payment. You can do the same for the adjustment and for the take back code if you'd like. It is not required that you set up separate payment entities or types. It's only if that helps you when running reports to break out insurance check payments based on insurance company. The note section here at the bottom of this insurance plan is for frequencies and limitations of the plan. Personally, I like to right click in this space and do a date and time stamp, although I do want to point out that you can change the font in here as well. I like to have the date and time stamp so that you know how current and accurate this information is that you're entering. Perhaps George's plan only allows two physicals to be done in a two-year time frame. That's something that could be important to know if George maybe had an exam last year and the timing is something to pay attention to. Moving on to the next tab of this plan is the contract at allowed amounts. It does make me save the insurance plan before moving forward, so I'll say yes. And this gives me an opportunity to enter Blue Cross Blue Shield's contracted allowed amount per code. You only have to do this for the codes that apply if you would like to. The benefit to this is that it'll store that information so it knows how much money to write off in the EOB entry screen. However, you will have an opportunity to enter that data on that screen as well. So we're just going to leave this blank for now and jump over to the PIN section. PINs are basically additional ID numbers that you'd like to attach to the insurance plan or the claim form through the insurance plan based on the provider you have selected. So for Blue Cross Blue Shield, whenever John Smith submits a claim, we want to go ahead and submit our Blue Shield provider number for John Smith. Here in the PIN section, I'm gonna type in John Smith's Blue Shield provider number. 
and I'm going to say that we do participate or accept assignment of benefits. And that covers our insurance plan section. We'll simply save our changes. Now we have a really comprehensive insurance plan set up. It is the second item. Um, I know that it is the second item because of the code sequence that was entered here. The BLU00 was the first Blue Cross plan entered. BLU01 is the second one that was entered. And I'm going to go ahead and select that insurance plan to attach to George. Go ahead and choose who the subscriber of the plan is and fill in the rest of this data. If the subscriber of this insurance plan happens to be um, George's mother, at this point we could say that his relationship to the subscriber is that he's the dependent. And then in the subscriber section, I would choose who he's the dependent of. You would not have filled out Blue Cross Blue Shield in this section if George is a dependent of the subscriber. Simply by selecting the subscriber, it will populate the insurance plan that the subscriber has already. So what that means to you is you do have to enter the subscriber in to your system as a patient, even if you mark them not a patient, in order to attach them to who your patient is. The system will pull the data from the subscriber's patient information screen and attach it to your actual patient here once you've entered all that data in. If you have any additional questions about entering insurance plans or the patient information into the system, please do contact the training department. As of now, we're going to stop here with the patient's information screen and save our changes. And I look forward to proceeding with you on our next video. Thank you.